Good afternoon. It is Monday, October 27th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Marketing Live on a special Monday edition. Um, today on Marketing Live, we're going to be discussing measuring what matters and using analytics and testing to evaluate your marketing efforts uh, with our guest, Nick Donardis, who's here with us today. Um, I'm your host, Tim Jones, broadcasting from beautiful Potsdam, New York, where I have the great honor to serve as the Associate Vice President of Marketing. Uh, Marketing Live is a part of the Higher Ed Live Network, a series of professional development web shows and podcasts which are always free and accessible to you in the archives at higheredlive.com and on iTunes. Today you can be part of the broadcast by tuning in live and sharing your insights and questions using the Higher Ed Live hashtag on Twitter. You can receive weekly updates with the live show dates and times by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with educational institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. And today's show, of course, would not be possible without the support of M. Stoner and Clarkson University. Uh, marketing Live is sponsored by Formstack. Formstack is a robust online form building solution with an intuitive drag and drop interface. The platform makes it easy for marketers to create branded, mobile ready web forms without writing code. Build donation forms, contact forms, event registrations, and more with the web's only 508 compliant form builder. Publish your forms in, uh, and use Formstack social media plugins to maximize your traffic. With in app analytics and partnerships uh, with popular marketing tools, you can get even more out of your captured data. Visit www.formstack.com to learn more about the ways Formstack can double your response rates. So again, uh, welcome to the show. This is Marketing Live, and today we're going to be talking about measuring what matters. And I have with me uh, today Nick Donardis, who I'll let introduce himself and explain a little bit about what he does um, for a living. So, hey, Nick, thanks for being here. Oh yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I am the director of digital communications at Wayne State University, uh, which is in Detroit. Uh, we are part of kind of central marketing and communications, although we've come from a very decentralized background. And so uh, we now oversee around 500 of the public facing sites on our campus and um, just kind of build all the back end tools to manage those sites from the CMS events calendar, form uh, creator, social dashboard, stuff like that. And then iterate on them as time goes on. <laughs> That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, so a little uh, bit of everything, yeah. Yeah. And um, in addition, also oversee the social media and digital signage and a couple of other random things on campus. And so, excellent, uh, fun yeah, stuff. So you stay busy, I guess. Oh, yeah. So this is a good, uh, good conversation, too, uh, just as a quick plug. Um, Nick and I are co-teaching or co-administering a symposium at AMA uh, or a seminar at AMA on the first day on Monday called Digital Metrics 101. So if anyone's going to be at AMA, please come uh, here. Nick and I talk in more, uh, a little bit more detail, a little bit more in depth on getting spun up with your digital measurement strategies and some techniques and tactics and opportunities to do that. It's going to be a great hands-on seminar where you'll leave with some um, information you, hopefully that'll help you in your job on a day-to-day -day basis. So I just had to throw that out there just as my <laughs> shameless promotion. So. Uh, be sure yeah, to, that should uh, be a lot of fun. Yeah, and come come find us at AMA too. I'll be there, and I know Nick will as well. So look yeah. forward. To it. All right. So digital measurement, and it sounds like you have your hands in pretty much every component of digital strategy uh, that exists, <laughs> particularly uh, there. And uh, I know that in recent years, uh, particularly, uh, there's been a lot of talk about return on investment and universities demanding more accountability. Uh, from marketers and from communicators to demonstrate that what they do matters, what they do is worth it. And um, that's great. I think it's fantastic. But every time we get a little bit closer to this idea of moving beyond raw counts and numbers and visits, and it used to be hits, then it was visits, now it's sessions, but people still ask me, how many people went to the site? And it always comes out of, out of uh, nowhere with no context whatsoever, no indication of whether the number of people visiting the site is the most important metric. And uh, I know that we're getting better as an industry, but I'm sure, uh, sure there's a lot more to it. And um, I want to talk a little bit today about how we go about changing that perception where it needs to be changed and how we go about demonstrating the value of more in-depth analysis and gathering of data and what we do with it. So on the one hand, that's dangerous because it would make our jobs a lot easier if we just had to count stuff. Um, but I don't know that we're doing too much for the industry. so. Uh, what should we be doing uh, as digital professionals and marketers to demonstrate the value of 
measurement beyond just raw counts and numbers. Do you have any thoughts on who you should be talking to, how we can go about that? So, I don't know if this is taking a step back or not, but I guess um, from my standpoint, a lot of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is really look at the entire user experience kind of holistically, right? And those raw numbers coming, you know, back from, that's what we only used to be able to, to d demonstrate, and that's why people are so used to and, and comfortable with them, uh, because literally they're from our own server logs, right? Right. <laughs> of these now huge monstrous services that track and come up with all of these um, more deeper analytics. At the end of the day, though, every one of those hits or visitors or sessions on, on your site is an individual, right? And so that's how I like to think about, um, at least from a standpoint of where to start. You know, is this an you know, admissions-related site? Is it an advancement-related site? Or is it, you know, some sort of current student or athletics or faculty staff type site, right? Every one of those visitors is coming there for a reason or purpose. And at the same way that someone would step foot on your physical campus, right, they're setting, they're set, setting foot on your, your website, and every piece of that site is going to be giving them an impression, right? If, if they're on your campus and all of a sudden there's a ton of construction going on, you know, even a block away, and it's mm -hmm. just really loud, and and that is a disruption that's happening through their real experience of your institution, and and those types of physical disruptions can affect how they think of your institution, whether they're going to apply, how how kind of um, interested they are in, in spending the rest of their time, yeah. <laughs> you know, at least a few years, uh, physically there, and that happens a lot on the web, and so from, I think, the best way to start thinking about um, analytics and ROI and from anyone who's asking for that level of information is to really get down to who the visitor is mm -hmm. and trying to get down to how close you can get to their, you know, who they are, the reason for coming, and, and what their expectations are. So some people might be literally like, is there class today for a, you know, a current student? Like if it's snowing out mm -hmm. and it might be closed, or it could be uh, someone who has no experience with their institution saw an ad and clicked on, clicked on it, and you, they basically you know, are, are painted with that, uh, that impression. And so mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's a long-winded way of saying that uh, hits do, do matter, but only when you can get them mm -hmm. down to a specific type of audience. And I right. know that... Um, and that can make people uncomfortable because it does involve mining a lot about those visitors, their actions, where they're coming from, and stuff like that. Uh, in order to get that level of information, it's not just, you know, are they coming from an on-campus computer or are they coming from an, you know what I mean? A lot of students just don't connect to Wi-Fi and they're on their cell phone, getting, you know, or tablet uh, getting to your website. So geolocation comes into, a, into play there and just, you know, and so... There, I think that um, trying to break down from hits as in just pure numbers to visits as in who an actual person is and starting to kind of collect them those, those uh, visits into groups that mm -hmm. then you can track some sort of meaningful metric is the, the, the first thing that I, I mm -hmm. feel like needs to happen with any site. And we've done a lot of, of redesign mm -hmm. sites on campus, and that's usually where we start is we look at some sort of baseline number, because that might be all they have, say Google mm -hmm. Analytics or another tool might not have been installed on the site, and then trying to figure out from an audience perspective who really is going there and what are they really doing currently in order to be able to iterate and come up with something that is at least 10, 20, hopefully even more percent better than that uh, for that specific audience. Yeah, so it's a lot about uh, establishing context for measurement before you just start counting randomly and reporting numbers back out. I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's there's a tendency to look at those numbers as an indication of popularity or an indication of uh, utility. But I always laugh if you know you could have a ton of visitors who had a terrible experience to your web presence, and that's actually not helpful <laughs> you know, to yeah. have to have three hundred thousand people who hated it and left. And so. That's where digging in a little bit more into analytics, so things as simple as bounce rate and looking at does it make sense for them to bounce from this page? Did we give them anything else to do while they were here? Um, and I think that uh, Google Analytics in particular, but some other measurement tools give us 
what we need to start making those connections. But but you talk you talked about the entire user experience and understanding where they were accessing uh, the site from, what kind of situation they were in. If they were just trying to answer a simple question like, is their class today, which um, this will be my first winter up here in the north, so I hear it doesn't get canceled ever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whereas in the south, that's, that wasn't quite the same. So, I mean, being able to answer all of those questions with the appropriate uh, pages and the appropriate content, and that really does involve knowing your users extraordinarily well, not just who they are, but their intent and what they're looking for, their expectations for your site, for your information, um, and being able to address that and move them to the kinds of things that they need uh, most effectively. So I love the idea of thinking about analytics as a way to get to know people rather than just a way to count them and sort of click through how many people showed up today. I think that's uh, the only way to go about this for, for it to be meaningful. So what kinds of connections do you look for in terms of things like mobile? How, how does that play into it? Um, what do you do differently if you know that a certain number of people are using the site with mobile or the mobile users tend to prefer different kinds of content? Do you see any patterns in, in what you're looking at on a day-to-day? -day? So, uh, uh, you know, the biggest question for people around campus is, oh, well, we're seeing a lot more mobile traffic. Our site needs to be redesigned as being responsive. And mm -hmm. in some cases, we found that that may not always be the case. Your site is usable, right? And because of the number of, of visitors uh, coming from mobile and the audience uh, of those visitors, it might, I don't want to say it doesn't make sense, but mm -hmm. it might not make sense at this time to really redesign the whole mm -hmm. site just so that way you know, someone can scroll this way instead of going like this, right? <laughs> and so, um, because at the end of the day, they're, they're either a small site or their content doesn't change a ton or their, um, that audience just doesn't really need it. So we have, in some cases, because of um, the audience, not redesigned sites, not, I'm going to say, we haven't started a redesign specifically to go responsive. Uh, right. We haven't told anyone not to if we're going to do it anyways, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to want to make, like, I don't think our designers and developers could even think doing non-responsive <laughs> sites anymore. Um, but we've had people hold off a little bit until they really understood why they were, were doing that. And then um, it's been a big change to, to educate uh, our, we call them clients, we kind of work like an agency on, on campus. And so when I say the word clients, I mean really the, the deans, directors, um, communicators throughout campus who oversee their school, college, department websites. Uh, and so, you know, they're, they're always concerned from a design perspective about above the fold still, even if, you know, there is, uh, <laughs> there, there's all of this data, we have it, everybody else has it, that people scroll, especially on, you know, any type of touch device. Mm -hmm whether that be tablet or mobile. And um, and there's still that big concern about what is above or below the fold. And, and um, we have found that making, like I guess from our biggest metrics have been that here's an action item that is below the fold and how many people on a tablet or a mobile device um, obviously aren't going to be seeing it how many people actually do scroll to click on it. Mm -hmm. And that for us has been a, a, a metric that we've been tracking specifically to, so that way we can break through that barrier, barrier of you know, pushing everything up uh, to be able to come up with an experience that is effective for the mm -hmm. user. And so for us, that's been the biggest thing that we've tracked from a mobile perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we still, you know, we don't, I don't, trying to think of any specific other goals that we uh, segment out for mobile um, other than specific ad related things that are right. only on like Pandora or you know like are only yeah. delivered to mobile yeah. users right mm -hmm. um, that we already have that kind of segmentation but um, I think the, scroll, that, the amount of scrolling to click has been the, the biggest uh, thing that we've tracked. Yeah I, I have to share this with the scrolling um, I won't disclose any specifics but I was in a meeting uh, going through a web proposed web redesign and a member of the faculty told told us that um, instead of scroll he would rather just put duct tape over his screen because he's going to ignore it anyways and so he had actually proposed taping the bottom half of his screen so he wouldn't have to look at anything to make his point which I think uh, <laughs> speaks to what we're up against when you're talking about scrolling but I'll, I'll move on from that but I, you mentioned scroll depth is uh, sort of 
being a, an indicator of engagement. And I think there's a lot of conversation around the difference between vanity metrics or just pure numbers and what people keep saying engagement metrics. But I th think to some extent that's a very loosely defined term. And, and so things like scroll depth do give you some indication of interaction with your content and willingness to interact and sort of where it continues to be relevant and where it doesn't. So what are some of the other, um, not necessarily specific to mobile, but where, where are some of the other engagement metrics that you're looking for when you try and make decisions about how to put together sites, redesign, where to put information, those calls to action, that sort of thing? So engagement metrics, it, for us it all depends on the content because one site might have completely different metrics than another. And so, um, so we we'll look a lot at uh, number of pages uh, per session, like how many pages did this person, depending on where they've entered from. Um, and a lot of times, unfortunately, it's just, uh, it's just because we, we want to try to refine the data as closely as possible. We will segment, and I know this is a lot of people will scoff at this, but we will segment <laughs> off on-campus on traffic from off-campus traffic. Um, and it's And a lot of that is that we can kind of ignore at least one group who we know probably already has some sort of connection to us. Mm -hmm. And I know there might still be a few people on uh, on campus who, who don't, um, but at least so that way we can get a good chunk of traffic out of our view so that mm -hmm. way we can refine it down to, at the very least, people who aren't on our, our network mm -hmm. already. And then, uh, so looking at pages, um, which did I mention already? Pages per session. Mm -hmm. uh, and seeing uh, first at a glance, you know, before we actually set the metrics to see like where that variation is, right? Is it mm -hmm. like ninety percent one page, and then like where does it kind of where where does the well it be, uh, like <laughs> doing this backwards here? So like, <laughs> like ninety percent on, on one page, and then like how far does it then come back around, or mm -hmm. is there a bump anywhere in like the four to five level? You know, like can we can we find a specific sweet spot that we can start? moving towards, just not guess at one. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with time on site, right? So like mm -hmm. per session. Uh, if there is a specific amount of time that we can increase by, you know, uh, maybe a second or half a second or something like that, depending on the amount of pages, those kind of go hand in hand. And being able to keep somebody engaged for a little bit longer. And for a lot of people that might mean, you know, um, write more words and then they'll read more <laughs> but <laughs> other people might be taking all of those words and reducing it down to you know headings bullets and just restructuring that same exact content to see if somebody will actually stay on the page longer with less words on the page mm -hmm. uh, and or more scannable content and that um, those two metrics have been uh, kind of at least a starting point uh, to figure out first uh, in most most departmental or um, program level uh, sites about how to keep somebody on the page longer. And mm -hmm. what we found is that beyond that, you know, the actual transaction of information, right, request for information, schedule a visit, mm -hmm. um, send me, you know, like send me something daily or, you know, something like that. Um, if we can keep somebody on the page just a little bit longer, those metrics kind of all like start going up just inherently without having us try to like make the you know request for information button bigger or brighter like you know if, <laughs> they'll find it if they really are interested is, is right. kind of what we're trying to get down to on a, on a specific site like um, you know we're doing this the, uh, we're right currently right now we're doing the art and art history uh, we're redoing the art and art history programs website and uh, all of, we found a big kind of Let's say um, missed opportunities, but like we found an opportunity that we can start utilizing a little bit more content that they had about careers and notable alums and some content that really wasn't being portrayed well enough in their mm -hmm. current site that we're going to highlight far better uh, on this new site. And you know, we've we kind of found that content by looking at certain, you know, like some what keywords on the page mm -hmm. like so within our own like internal site search uh, and just kind of looking at what traffic coming in what people are actually going to and what pages are, are getting more and more of 
uh, like on a per page, <laughs> like not looking at in the whole flow, but like on a per page, which page is getting the amount of time spent on that page. Mm-hmm. And so that that by looking at those types of metrics and and looking at kind of uh, the, a length of time and number of pages uh, and what they're on, we found good better opportunities to um, to highlight stuff in a way that then yields that what most people see as the ultimate goal, right? Some sort of transit, like some sort of next step action. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we found um, a pretty good correlation between them. And we didn't even have to rechange the design, make some something like obnoxious uh, with those buttons and stuff like that yep. uh, that a lot of people want to, to do. It's just like, move the button around and all this stuff. And really, at the end of the day, no one's interested in that button if they can't find, you know, something specific or they can't find some co- piece of content engaging. So you're saying that content is actually influential in conversions? That sounds crazy. It's not just <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, and then um, we chatted just briefly before we uh, went on air about landing pages and and the tendency for people to say we just need a, a single call to action. It's you know, I click on an ad and then it's sign up now and you forget that it does sometimes take a little bit of time to influence somebody to believe that's a good decision or a helpful or um, something that's worthwhile for them at all. So I do think that content plays um, probably the most important role in uh, conversions, which I know when we talk about analytics, everyone wants you know conversions or goal completion and that sort of thing. But what you're describing is using all the elements of the experience to sort of facilitate that conversion of the end goal. Um, but I also think that might probably does require... Uh, a keen understanding of what those bottom line outcomes are uh, for a digital property, for a web presence, for a campaign, and that kind of thing. So, how do you go about aligning those um, those metrics, the engagement metrics, and the time on site, the pages visited per session, that sort of thing, with those business goals that are as basic as more applications, um, more inquiries, um, more money into the university, that kind of thing. Yeah. So. That's an interesting question because I feel like um, there are a lot of institutions who are in the same boat as us, but um, maybe either more to the extreme or less to the extreme. I, you know, I, I haven't um, taken have a good understanding recently, uh, but I feel like for the hard numbers of things, it really comes from the the marketing department because they're they're and especially the the marketing, uh, like our marketing director, who who is literally, you know, like placing the ads, like a, like paid for ads that are going out there, whether that be pay for impressions or clicks or, or whatever, and the different properties and giving getting the demographics down. They're they're really, from my experience, the only one who is really making sure that their specific return on investment is being made and trying to come up with tweaks and stuff like that. Um, and I, I think that's for a, a, a lot of reasons. Um, imagine, so, uh, imagine if your website was all of a sudden reset 10 years, right? Well, to back what it what used to be, you know, in 2004. Uh, would, and that experience and it, that it, the content, say the content was the same, right? Mm-hmm. Um, would that, like, would anybody, and, and people were still coming into the programs, people were still, like, requesting information, calling, and stuff like that. Like, would that, who would be, who would be the one that is really looking out for that bottom line ROI mm-hmm. of the website and getting concerned that, oh, maybe this isn't coming down, getting the, having the great, the best experience that it, it can have uh, now that it's 2014, 15-ish, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, I feel like there is, especially in higher ed, if it's up there, it works, it's out of sight, out of mind, and there isn't somebody who is like literally trying to push the envelope every mm-hmm. week or every month other than those, those marketing staff because they're the ones who do have dollars on the line. They're putting, you know, a couple hundred dollars in here, a couple hundred dollars in there, a thousand dollars there. They want to make sure that they're they're getting that some output mm-hmm. or that they're not just blanketing it out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, yeah, and I think from the paid advertising side, it's important for anyone responsible for outcomes associated with paid advertising uh, to be on top of analytics in a way that very few other people in the institution likely are. 
Um, I know we do things uh, here at Clarkson and in previous jobs um, that, that seem simple and seem maybe like at first wasteful where we will do a really short limited run uh, of say Facebook ads that compare two language tweaks on a message and we see which one tracks better not just overall we don't look at the raw numbers but among people who are interested in math and science which one's more likely to encourage some interaction with the ad and then following through with that what do they do once they're on the landing page and how effective is that and I think we uh, start with testing and we start with the analysis piece so that we know when we do make major investments we're not going to find out that we probably should have tested before we invested at a huge <laughs> level and I think people um, it's, it's easy to overlook the function of testing up in the creative you're like this is fantastic this looks awesome we're gonna get this in front of everybody everywhere and I know everyone's seen those banner ads that are uh, that appear to be wholly out of place for the site that they're on simply because no one tested, no one said who, who's responding to this, where is this going to show up, what demographic are we actually going to draw with this, and then moreover, if we deliver them to a landing page that isn't optimized, that isn't clear, that doesn't provide that context and content that uh, will contribute to the eventual conversion, um, you can you can lose a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of potential engagements with people through that process. So I, I agree, I think the marketing departments are accountable for metrics whether they want to be or not and I think that's um, that's an important shift I, th I think that we all need to make in, in the industry too. Yeah. So, it, uh, so I got a question for you. So yeah. the, those those tests that you run, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've gotten pushback in the pack, past of like those short-term tests mm -hmm. like it's kind of we know this is going to work let's just go with it uh, and like how much time do we really have to waste on this this testing thing and stuff like that like how how long do you run those those tests for? Um, Two weeks. I, I think to you it qualifies as like this is a, a winner uh, compared to the other one, or this is trending better, or whatever. Um, in order to kind of justify that pre time before the actual ad goes up. Well, I think a lot of it is um, clearly stating the strategic goals that you have for whatever the campaign is. It's not um, typically not general awareness or broad awareness. I think that's the easiest to ignore measurements because then you're looking at impressions and you pretty much buy that number uh, wherever you want it and the art of that is deciding who those impressions have the potential to be. But I think when you're looking for conversion oriented advertising or conversion oriented promotion at all, uh, you need to have a clearly stated objective. You know, uh, so, for instance, our most recent one is we need to, or we'd like to increase the number of prospective students who are interested in biology. So we look at biology, we look at not just saying, join our team now, we have biology, but looking at what kind of messages resonate with people who have some indication of interest in biology. So is that health and public health and well-being, is that something that's going to track well with that audience? Or is it more medical research pre-med or what kind of hook do we look for? And I think part of it for me is the research refines the creative. And when you're putting time and money into creative, spending 50 bucks a day for two weeks is a drop in the bucket considering how much money you could waste with terrible or failed creative uh, that you then invest in. And you pay, what is it, $10,000 for a full page ad in the Chronicle that may or may not do anything for you. I mean, you're just wasting money if you don't have any sense of whether it will or won't be effective. And so um, we, I usually shoot for shoot as low as possible, 50 bucks a day for two weeks for a specific limited test where we run two or three different versions of an ad. Um, and if we have more time and money, we do a couple versions of um, ads or promoted posts or anything like that in front of different demographics. So we can break it down to um, among people in the prospective student demographic, they responded better to this one, this one, and this one. And there's so many variables, though. That's the, the challenge. Is, uh, we've even tested things like the exact same message with a different icon in the sidebar just to see which one drew better. And you know, Things like athletics logos tracking better with alumni, not uncommon. Um, and people could say, well, I know that would work. But oddly, you find that that's not always true. It just depends on the other context uh, or where that is or where you're displaying that ad. So uh, I can't say enough about short-run testing because too often people just jump in and say, well, we'll spend... 100,000 of our marketing dollars in print publications and it's totally going to be worth it because I'll have a print publication to show someone. And even if that's the outcome, if we do something on the digital space where we can measure and we can watch how people interact with the destinations, so they go from a digital ad that, that's talking about the promise of 
I don't know, curing cancer, just to, to be hyperbolic about it, but cure cancer by joining this program, and you see that once they get to the site, instead they go check out your athletic scores. You know, <laughs> you're clearly, clearly they're clicking on it for the wrong reason, uh, or it's not really going to get you what you want, even though if you stop your tracking there, it's uh, we placed an ad and they clicked through. So uh, I, I think it goes hand in hand, testing to know what tracks and what's, what's generating that inbound traffic, but also understanding how to qualify it based on their behaviors on site. And um, I can't say enough about it. Uh, $50 a day is about as cheap as you could possibly get. Um, I think LinkedIn actually has a cap of $10 a day that you can do. Um, but, you know, doing a quick two-week run and then take the best of what you have and then invest in it or double down. And sometimes you'll know faster than that. I mean, the great thing about digital is you get pretty instantaneous responses. So after two or three days and one ad is performing extraordinarily poorly, you know you can just ditch it and run and or ditch it and try another one and say, you know, this one's working. What if we elevated the language around um, curing cancer even more? Or what if we sort of backed out a little bit and did uh, something broader and more sort of come to Potsdam, New York or whatever it is? So, um, yeah, you can test a lot of things that people um, – and you can take away a lot of argument too. So when you present it to the board or somebody else and they say, well, I really don't think that speaks to our students, you can say, well, actually <laughs> – you have data that indicates that it does, and not only does it speak to them, once they arrive at the site, we then convert them by giving them white papers, having them send out uh, inquiries, requests for information, that kind of stuff. And, and some of the same things you were talking about, sort of how long they spend on the site and what kind of content they're interacting with, where it is on the page versus where it's not, and that kind of thing. All of that should be playing into every decision you make, particularly when it comes to limited resources and limited budget. If I can tell someone, if we spend, you know, $500 on the front end before we spend 10000 you know, I'll, I'll take the 9500 to invest rather than just 10000 blind. I mean, I, I would rather do yeah. it that way, so. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 and it's all, I think a lot of that is, um, I, you know, kind of following up on that, some of what you speak to is a lot of planning, mm -hmm. and so that does take time, and a lot of times things are like, you know, administrators or, or whoever doesn't get numbers till maybe later and then all of a sudden once they see the numbers they're it's an emergency they need to get more yep. physics students or, or whatever right um, as crunch time to the semester um, comes about and, and stuff like that and so uh, I think coming up with with being in you know, I guess like who is so is the marketing person is that their role is to be the advocate for that level of data and that level of planning and and um, I guess fiscal responsibility with say mm -hmm. a specific department's budget uh, or does that come down to the department and then you know really marketing can just be an you know an advisor of what what they should end up doing I guess you know yeah. like where does that where does that come from <laughs> I don't know I think I think that they haven't uh, there isn't a clear cut uh, description for that kind of work, at least not in higher ed, uh, or an expectation rather that somebody is going to put that much time into it. Because, like you said, we can set it and forget it in a lot of places and, and uh, just kind of move on, unless someone is holding us or yourselves accountable for those outcomes at a very, very specific level. Um, but I've said this many times funding follows success. It's typically not the other way around. Uh, so if you can go to someone and say, here's a minor investment in uh, this test or sort of looking at looking at how we're approaching this and here are the brand attributes that we're conveying, here are the uh, metrics that support this sense of identity that we've, uh, we've put out there in the market. Are you willing to invest in it now that we know it's effective and know it's working? And the answer is more often than not, yes, at least at a limited level, people will give you, um, <laughs> funding comes when, you, when they know that it's investing in something that is likely to have some kind of outcome. And I also think, um, Universities as a whole are, are responsible for that level of reporting. I think that we need to hold each other accountable. One of the things that we do here and uh, when I was at NC State, the same kind of thing is before someone proposes a project and assumes that it's going to get done, ask for their measurement strategy. Ask how they're going to evaluate whether or not it was successful. Uh, I'd say nine times out of ten, people can't answer that right away. And forcing them to think through, okay, so if people read it, is that enough? Is that all we're trying to get out of this? In some places, that's exactly what you want, is that information share. Some places, it's just read a news release online. If we can just get one person who visits the homepage to read this news release, it's, it justifies its position on the website. So uh, I think everyone should be accountable for that level of uh, planning and thought and just 
being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, if nothing else. I mean, that's part of it, uh, for me at least. So, But I don't yeah, know. I, I think universities... Go ahead, sorry. Well, I was going to say, and, and that comes down to a lot of... Like a lot, a lot of universities, not like currently, um, still host you know host their own websites. They host their own servers and everything like that. So that means space is basically unlimited. Bandwidth mm -hmm. is basically unlimited. Um, you know they don't have. There's no repercussion for old content to be sitting out there and never being looked at. There, you know there's there's no downsides to it. And I think mm -hmm. you know maybe more as we go as more institutions go to. Um, you know, hosting externally, like with, you know, with Amazon or, or Rackspace or whatever else, um, uh, that the the idea of having some sort of hard cost associated with the traffic to your site, and and I I hope it brings some sort of level of um, of meaning, like of meaningfulness uh, for people who don't necessarily and. You know, or currently don't think about uh, the implications of having old content out there, or, you know, stuff that that um, that doesn't add a lot of value out there. Um, because at the end of the day, eventually it'll be start sucking up bandwidth, you know, costing more money, and and potentially not have an impact that it should. And so, uh, I think that's one thing that um, you know, I guess we're spoiled with the even just like having free Wi-Fi going all over the place, right? And <laughs> yeah. and having uh, you know, like being able to encounter sites that have a lot of graphics and a lot of you know um, bells and whistles to their user experience, but at the end of the day, are sucking like a lot of your personal bandwidth. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't have unlimited bandwidth and in, in your connection, whether that be wired or wireless or whatever. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a bummer. It's something that somebody thinks about when they when they're mm -hmm. under those constraints. And I think having some of those constraints around our web hosting may reintroduce that thought into a lot of people's minds. I agree, and I think the um, the possibility of content creating a liability for universities because it's not being measured uh, or just sort of pleading ignorance is it's it's real and it's there. You know, when you have international students who are applying for visas or, or whatever uh, other requirements go into that process and they're using outdated information that's not particularly good for anybody uh, and that does affect that bottom line and and you know as as much as we want to make everything friendly for any kind of audience ever a lot of the times we're missing the point we're trying not trying to facilitate specific outcomes we're just hoping that somebody uses it and hoping that somebody finds value in it and Assuring ourselves that someone somewhere cares if this page from 1998 is still up there, or if this PDF that was really, really good six years ago, even though it's been rewritten by other researchers ten times, we we totally need to keep that. And I think until it becomes a liability, everyone can ignore it. <laughs> I think uh, that's an unfortunate uh, reality. I do think that data and analytics and I guess a, almost an institutional commitment to measurement is is required there. And I'm curious how, how you're staffed for people who, at the very least, pay attention to analytics and, I guess, at a, at a bigger level, who's responsible for implementation but also sort of the analysis side of analytics, not just the data capture piece. So I'm staffed. Uh, my department is basically staffed to have me. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the one who uh, who does most of the legwork for both the implementation and just kind of the tracking and discovery and and um, reporting out. Uh, there are we have a, a web content administrator who does look at the analytics quite a bit and will kind of um, prompt specific things to be tracked and things like that. Um, on our our kind of on an overall basis, uh, they they will dive in uh, specifically when we do redesigns to look at both you know pre um, what we're going to actually track when launched and then post launch for mm -hmm. redesigns for specific sites and specific reasons. Um, but I'm the only one who's kind of really looking at the broader sense of where people are going from one site to another to another. Some like overarching goals and um, and how, like, our web, imp the things that we do from an implementation standpoint are affecting our web visitors as, as, a, as a whole. 
Um, and then in addition, uh, not within the web group, but our marketing uh, director, uh, she is the one who's really looking and driving those, uh, the actual ads and the, the landing pages, the return on investment on those. And um, she's doing a light amount of um, the implementation of that tracking. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing most of it, uh, but she's really the one in there every day looking mm -hmm. at it switching stuff up and being the you know the one to to really get as much out of that investment as mm -hmm. possible um, I don't have you know the time in, in my day to look for you know do that for every site that we manage um, but I'll, I'll be in there in a routine and mm -hmm. I'll be looking for trends and things that that pique my interest uh, over time to to start bringing those things to attention mm -hmm. so yeah there really isn't any like it's in my job responsibility. It's not my primary job um, by any means. Uh, but we don't really have somebody who is, like a, I don't know, say, chief data officer, chief data, co you know, like I, you know, like I don't even know what would that be. <laughs> we were kind of talking before about like a title what that would be, but I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah, know. it's it's interesting that it, uh, I guess, in some ways, it's um similar to how social media managers uh, sort of emerged in higher education. It took, took critical mass and sort of that sense of urgency to demand that we created staff positions for it. And I would love to see the same for measurement and analysis, uh, specifically on the communication side. I know a lot of universities do have university planning and analysis that does a little bit of this, but in terms of digital measurement, I don't know that it's uh, as pronounced as it could be. And as I certainly know... Uh, here, we have a handful of people who have been lucky enough to go through training for Google Analytics, and that, that helps quite a bit, but it's just three three of us <laughs> who have done it, and none of us is responsible for it. We just have the knowledge when it's needed, and I think that's, that's just as problematic in some ways as uh, not prioritizing it and not having it uh, be an expectation for anything that we do ever on behalf of the university is held to some kind of measurement standard or at least some indication of success and failure in a plan for optimization over time. And I think I'd love to see that be someone's entire job someday in the great distant future. Who knows? Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get it. Yeah, and I, I would hope that it, they don't just become... Um, and I would love to hear from any institution that... Like, I'm sure you would too, to, mm -hmm. uh, Tim, to, that any institution that has this type of role. Um, and I would... I, I, I guess I wonder how much that role could end up just being like a web janitor, right? Where they're just kind of going and finding all these pages that no one's going to and cleaning them up and and really their their day is chasing mm -hmm. obsolete and you know, those requirements from international state like chasing that data around and, mm -hmm. and making sure that people are on top of actually updating it compared to being able to really advance that experience on the web that's and, a, and that's an excellent point, yeah. I, I think that's yeah, too often analytics emerge or become part of the conversation when you're trying to shoot someone down or <laughs> make some sort of compelling point that you haven't been able to resolve any other way. So, you know, I've, I've, I've been on both sides of this on the, we only had 19 people go to that, so it's useless. Instead yeah. of the, we should maybe think about what we're trying to accomplish and how to optimize it. But unfortunately, analytics can be um, used, <laughs> used in that way a little bit too often. So... <laughs> Let's switch gears just a little bit and talk a little bit about social media measurement. I know yeah. you mentioned you do a lot of that. On the same way that we kind of look at the engagement metrics on the digital experience side and the destinations and our uh, web presence, what are you looking for with social media? And I know it probably varies a little bit from channel to channel, but just sort of broad trends and things you're looking for and how you assess efficacy in your channels and, and your content. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a little tough because... From our standpoint, let me see if I can find this real quick. Um, we we try to have a good like we'll take say Twitter for example because that's probably the easiest to um, to both implement and mm -hmm. to to manage, especially from an analytics standpoint over over time uh, because you can see, especially now if you go to like ads.twitter.com, um, it's built right in. Uh, even if you don't run ads, uh, mm -hmm. most institutional accounts are large enough that they'll give you a lot of the tools within there um, for analytics. Hold on, sorry. Um, 
that's weird. I'm getting another <laughs> analytics call. Well, <laughs> I thought it was uh, Jeopardy. Oh, can you hear that or no? Yeah. <laughs> it's the Jeopardy music. Is one second. <laughs> All right, there we go. Well, that's totally weird because I hit decline and it's no still worries. ringing. Um, Persistence. So right within. Uh, figure out where I'm going here. All right, so right within now ads.twitter.com, you can see you know an, an actual engagement rate per tweet mm -hmm. um, and a number of engagements, impressions, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. That um, you could kind of only guess before. Uh, you could get you could. You know, see how many people clicked through if you're using a short URL system, and then each of those short URLs could have you know a campaign code, and a medium, and a source, and stuff like that. And you could even have, if you were using that same message on different mediums, you can you know have those different sources and mm -hmm. stuff like that in there. Uh, but I think that Twitter a lot now gives you a pretty good. And what I like about it, it's also like in realish time or closer to realer time than at least um, Facebook analytics have ever been. Um, I, I'm sorry, I just get so frustrated with the Facebook analytics that uh, their interface um, that this is like a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. uh, and just being able to see, so from our standpoint, um, we're looking for a good mix of, we try to do um, like 50%, it comes down to about 50% like replies. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just the nature of our account, right? Every account's going to mm -hmm. be a little bit different for every institution and user group. 50% um, of our like tweets and our messages that we post are replies to people. Um, well, then we have another like 20 to 30 percent. We'll call it. Let's call it 25 percent. Um, that are retweets. So stuff that somebody else has posted, uh, whether it be an institutional, another institutional account, or one of our student, you know, one of our followers, or something mm -hmm. else that we've we've seen as a retweet, and then try to keep it under uh, 20, 25 percent for what we would call like selfish posts. Stuff mm -hmm. that is literally, you know, like we're promoting it. And there's, you know, it's it's an original post. And mm -hmm. from what from what we found is that that gets the highest number of engagements overall. Uh, that we've like by interacting with our audience, uh, we'll add more people in. They'll get more. Like we don't we don't keep track of like followers of followers. And and mm -hmm. if the like our uh, how much their their follower rate is kind of growing yeah. over time. But we'll we'll look at just the number of, um, of followers who are interacting with each other. Uh, and we found that replying definitely helps that, um, that grow. Uh, we've had a few, and we've almost like tested this accidentally, not accidentally, but we had a, a time period a few, maybe it was quite a bit ago now, uh, almost a year ago, where we had a lower number of staff. So like, you know, our social... Um, also, I'll say that we don't have a full-time social media person. It's really shared. That responsibility is shared in my department between three people. And so we build a lot of tools to kind of manage a lot of it. And what we found is that when we, there, we had decreased time to manage, you know, interacting with our audience, their interactions between each other kind of slowed down. Uh, and as we got staff back and were able to, to focus more on it, their interactions came back up. And... Um, so we know how important it is to not only um, reply to individuals, but also reply to groups of individuals um, mm -hmm. within our follower stream. The I other think, thing, go ahead, sorry. I, I think a lot of that's true regardless of the social channel, that the oh. um, value of saying that we, uh, we, need to, we need to engage, we need to engage our users, we need to engagement metrics, and and putting that entirely on your audience rather than on the people who are facilitating it too. I think that that's a really critical a critical point is that engagement is two way communication, not just one way. And I think it's easy to forget that, particularly when um, in some places we're still growing out of uh, the tendency to just shove our press releases and news uh, down every social media channel and not understand why people aren't paying attention or why isn't anyone sharing this stuff and really what you're saying is that there's a lot of back and forth and conversation and reply and 
well, social, for, for lack of yeah. a better, better way to say it, and it really does drive engagement and probably it probably translates into much more um, of that eventual conversion data that, that um, the ROI people are after. Yeah, and for us it was unfortunate because a, a lot of it came from, well, you know, it just in general people use social to, to vent. And yep. so it was just us taking upon ourselves to make sure, you know, if, if there's a complaint, somebody mentions us and either it's, you know, something's wrong, there's misinformation, or we need, you know, we can do some legwork to help somebody, um, we'll do that. And mm -hmm. then that's really what kind of spurs the relationship between uh, mm -hmm. our at least institutional account and a lot of our followers is that, you know, they were so frustrated with parking or, you know, something yep. that they just were like, they posted it, we saw it, we started a conversation, and then now they're, you know, most of the time they're advocating on our behalf, right? You're still going to find those haters who you will never going to convert, but yep. you'll uh, the ones that do become really good advocates, and it doesn't start with you posting that there's some sort of event tonight and they just so happen to hear it. It really, uh, you know, unfortunately it's kind of prompted by them, uh, but you being there, Mm -hmm. as if you were in person. You know, if this person was sitting in your office, how would you respond? You wouldn't just ignore them, right? You're going to respond <laughs> and, and try to be, make them an advocate for, for your institution or their program or, or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's always interesting to see those, uh, and this, I guess, gets to the um, broader idea of vanity metrics. It's interesting to see those accounts where if you click on the tab that's both tweets and replies, you see nothing but at so-and-so, sorry to hear that, please contact our customer service. I'm sorry that happened, and nothing but apologies and attempts to reconcile with customer service. And in that case, you could say, but we have two million followers. And you're like, sure, but yeah. one million of them are complaining all the time, and, that's, uh, and I think that's the danger of vanity metrics and establishing context and really, um, it, it, it's maybe a, a leap, but tying back to some strategic goals. And so if your goal is to be a small friendly, personal in a community or a university that attracts students who are interested in personal attention and then you ignore them in social. It doesn't matter how many followers you have if they're all pissed off at you. So, totally. Yeah. So what about, um, what do you do? I mean, Facebook's analytics are not the uh, easiest to, to divine, but how, how do you, what are you looking for there? So for Facebook, it's really like, it's not, we I don't know if it's our audience or or what, but we haven't found as big of a community in our like main Facebook presence, our our page, right? Like our official page. Um, that really is more outward facing than any of our other properties. Mm -hmm. uh, we will get a lot of like private messages on there or um, or replies into the page that we'll follow up on, but we won't. We don't really, other than. Like a, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we don't really use that that property the same way that we use kind of Twitter. What we found is that we'll go in and try to we consult with anyone on campus who wants to use social as you know to represent the institution or their department or program, and we'll go in and figure out how they can be successful. And what we've found is that like using um, and we try. What we end up trying to do is get those groups to come up with a strategy. A, a lot of times, it is Facebook um, to have start or expand their community there. And we come up with some sort of goals, and that could be just having a presence, getting news to students who don't go to their website, stuff like that. We found it that like Facebook pages or groups are really good for those really specific audiences like say like criminal justice right like they're um, they had they wanted to you know go uh, and be on social media and, and use that as a platform and so as we kind of worked with them we found that you know they they started to get an audience and they they found that the best things to to um, communicate to their both current and alums was job opportunities or internships and things that are happening within the criminal justice world, right? Mm -hmm. And they ended up becoming this like very niche criminal justice like platform where people would students would go over there and they would post questions about stuff. There would be alums on there who had like real answers to things and they were able to to use that as a, a platform to communicate across 
uh, the mainly from a current student to perspective or to to alumni um, uh, audience and when they use that then in conjunction with their marketing materials prospective students saw this rich environment of discussions that there were opportunities for for the degrees and and there was this kind of support network it became this kind of marketing I don't say like a platform that they were able to utilize and not just say oh yeah we have jobs trust us you know like yeah. they had some stuff behind it and yeah. what we found from Facebook is that's where we spend a lot of our time and resources um, uh, facilitating those types of communities mm -hmm. and they may not be like under the direct you know overarching university control and stuff like that but they are still building the institution's brand within a specific audience and mm -hmm. and um, because if we tried tried a couple times to go too general or try to hit all audiences or you know a specific um, too unspecific it we haven't got a lot of feedback and I think because directly for the medium people are looking for really good value and and if it's too general that value just isn't there for them yeah and I think um, having those vibrant communities is critical and I think there's probably a pretty strong correlation between the topics of those niche discussions and the kinds of referral traffic you're getting on your site too to take it to sort of that connected connected interface that we have so I think um, looking at the effectiveness of content not just in its potential to facilitate conversation in the website but how it um, how it sends traffic to places where you can have those sort of business interactions or business transactions but I I would wager that you could draw a pretty strong correlation between the topics that are being discussed in those niche communities where they're vibrant and thriving and the kinds of things that people are looking for when they do uh, interact with your brand in a different channel as well so I think there's probably a lot there and yeah. I know that like I know particularly with Facebook we um, don't spend a lot of time on how many followers we have or anything like that but we do we do try hard to use it as a referral engine for our, our website where we feel better about some of the things that we're doing and in some places we don't feel good about it at all <laughs> so we try and keep them with steer them in a different direction I guess but yeah excellent well, we're um, just about out of time is there anything else um, we want to jump into with the last three oh, minutes let's see here other than to remind people to come sign up for the AMA uh, Thing so they can hear like a four-hour conversation. Oh yeah, we've got plenty of time to talk about this, and I think what will be good about the AMA discussion is that it will be a lot more hands-on. Uh, yeah. And so we'll have you know topics and ideas, but I think a lot of it's going to come down to you know uh, yep. each one you with a laptop looking at your data, and and maybe even we can analyze. You know, we'll see how that goes. Analyze it as a group and things like yep. that. So. If, um, there will be lots of great minds in the room. Yeah. It will be a great space to, to get some insights, some real actionable things and or things implemented. Absolutely. We can uh, maybe run some test ads, see how that goes. We'll see. <laughs> see <Yeah. how> <laughs> well, thanks again, Nick, for being here. We're at the end of the conversation. So thank always to our program sponsors, M. Stoner and Formstack. Um, and feel free to browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. Again, I'm Tim Jones and we'll be back with you next month on Marketing Live. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you, Tim.